Now, just before we continue with today's video, I do want to give a shout out to today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard of Vessi. Maybe you have because you've seen me talk about them before. But these have absolutely, I mean, not these ones. These I kept nice and clean so I could show them on camera. But I have other pairs of Vessis. This is one. There's another one that I have over there in the hallway. And they have absolutely become my go-to pair of shoes. I used to wear like boots and leather shoes and you know like all sorts of different shoes all year round and now every morning there is no other pair that i'm putting on other than my vessies why well for one they're 100 percent waterproof and they say here say waterproof don't say water resistant and basically what that means is uh no water comes in it's not like oh yeah 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 they'll get a little bit wet and then your socks will get damp after a while it's no 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 you can put these in the shower like there is b-roll that jen is probably showing you of me just soaking these shoes in the shower and then the feet are perfectly dry inside. It's amazing. Like, it's winter right now. I wear them in the snow. I wear them in the rain. I don't worry about puddles. Even this pair, which I've been... Uh, of course, I want to show you guys the new one. But even this pair, which I've been wearing pretty much every day for the last year and a half, still, I walk through puddles. It is still waterproof. I just assumed that was something that wore off after a while. It is not. It's amazing. It's made from something called Dymatex. And thank you for including a pronunciation guide, Vessi. Uh, a dual climate knit material that keeps you cool in summer and warm in winter. It doesn't feel like it should be waterproof. Yeah, you're, you're not getting your feet all sweaty in there. It's ama I just wear them year round. How many other shoes can you just wear year round? It's amazing. Uh, sustainably made and vegan. Brilliant. Comfortable, lightweight, breathable. I think I implied that. Discuss my personal experience. I think I did. It's basically, I put the shoes on and I don't take them off. Like, they're the only shoe I wear. I'm not even exaggerating. I mean, granted, I don't. If I had to go somewhere like Smart, which required like leather shoes, obviously I'd wear leather shoes. But every other time, I am in my Vessies. I don't know how much more of a stronger plug I can give it. Vessies are my go-to shoes by my door. Okay, yeah, we said that. We got it, guys! Check them out at the link below or go to Vessie.com and get your own pair of Vessie shoes. You really should. Um, you won't regret it. They're just great. <laughs> All right, and back to the video. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I'm your host, Simon. And what we have today is a piece written by George. I will be absolutely upfront with you. There was a bit of a disaster with this piece the first time around. I uh, recorded the whole thing. It's about, I can't remember how long it was. It was long. It's a big, thick script. And uh, then Jen was like, yo, fact boy. <laughs> You've used the wrong microphone, haven't you? I have two microphones at this location because I also shoot another couple of channels here, just the YouTube channels, and I use a different microphone, which you can see down here. And uh, that microphone was the one recording this entire episode, rather than this one, which is pointed at my mouth. And the audio sounded horrible. And Jen was like, "I can try and clean it up," and I'm like, "Oh, it's not going to work, is it?" And she was like, "No, it didn't work." <laughs> so. Uh, uh, normally what happens on this show is it's a cold read, like I've never read it before. Uh, but I've definitely read this one. The good news is, uh, we actually made some improvements to the script. I, I mentioned to George how he's like, Simon, I haven't seen my, uh, scripts come out yet. And I'm like, yeah, George, um, <laughs> I recorded it and it didn't work. And now I'm just trying to mentally recover before recording it again. And, uh, he's like, oh, well, in that case, let me make some improvements. Because, uh, I'd mentioned to George that it was a little bit brutal. George wrote uh, one piece and I was like, uh, what was my feedback to him? It's like, George, less saw, more CSI. So George has made some adjustments to this one as well to make it a little less sorry. There was one scene in particular, which uh, I'll probably mention when we come to it, where I was like, oh my God, I did not finish it because it was too dark. So we're talking about uh, the Eight Immortals murders. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, that's this has been the longest introduction ever. I'm so sorry. Let's just get into it. We are no strangers to brutality on this show, ladies and gentlemen. In the last, in the 12 months that the casual criminal has been examining evil and magnifying the macabre, Simon has discussed a doctor who murdered hundreds of his community's most vulnerable, beheadings on public transport, and the dissolving of human remains in acid baths, to name but a few. Yeah, and I remember every single one of those. It was Shipman killing his patients in the UK, which was, he's like arguably the most prolific serial killer ever. I think it's probably if not the one of the most popular videos uh, and podcasts that we've made. The acid bath dude was the, was that the Pakistani guy who was uh, just dissolving the bodies in his apartment? And then the beheading on the public transport was the Canada, the Canada Greyhound story. 
and I've been on the Greyhounds and I reminisced about that one. <laughs> God damn, all of these were horrible. <laughs> this shit was so traumatic. Nonetheless, I feel it's only fair that I issue a content warning for today's show, as today's case is so twisted and foul that frankly producing this script rendered me uneasy for a time. It's not beat about the bush, today's episode con concerns the butchering and disposal of an entire family of ten in a single night in 1980s Macau. All necessary efforts have been made to present the facts of the case frankly and fairly, to preserve the humanity of today's victims, and to deride the evil creatures which ended their lives. As tempting as it may be to duck out of today's episode following that warning, I would implore you all with strong stomachs to remain. Outside of Hong Kong, Macau, and the Guangdong province of China, this case is all but unknown, barely making a footprint in popular memory. Remain with us today, ladies and gentlemen, not to hear the story of a murder, but to hear the story of heroism in the face of unremitting evil, to hear the story of the brave men and women who sought justice for the killer, and most importantly, to learn about and memorialize the poor victims in your minds. And with that, let us begin. The Wild West of Asia Those of you who visited Macau may find it an unlikely backdrop for such a tale of unmitigated violence and brutality. And indeed, modern Macau most certainly is. I don't know much about Macau. My sister and my uh, brother-in-law went to Macau a few years ago on their honeymoon and uh apparently it's like asian vegas or something there's like loads of gambling there are giant hotels i mean it's not where i would choose to spend my honeymoon but uh i get the appeal i think it's like they like vegas and i don't like vegas vegas to me like i mean you know like the strip and the gambling it just feels i don't know like disneyland for adults and i also don't really like gambling and i also went to vegas when i didn't really have any money maybe vegas is better if you have more money but I don't know, the way I view it is casinos, it's just you walk in and then they statistically remove a certain amount of your money and then you leave. And it's like, oh, well, why did I do that? <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Macau is one of the richest places on earth. In 2020, it surpassed Qatar as the location with the highest gross domestic product per person on a purchasing power parity basis. So basically how much money, how much you can get for your money. Its GDP per capita in 2019 was 86,117 and 66 cents. Uh, dollars and 66 cents which is incredibly specific whoever puts together those numbers this wealth is built upon that most traditional of human vices gambling gambling alone makes up roughly 50 percent of this juggernaut of an economy and 23 casinos are crammed in onto the tight macau peninsula around these casinos have sprung a monoliths of steel and glass so much construction has taken place in macau since the 1999 handover from portugal to china that the city actually ran out of space, and accordingly, roughly 33% of modern Macau is reclaimed land clawed back from the sea. I, you know, I like, like to tell my little personal anecdotes and stories in these episodes, which some people love and some people are like, why are you doing this? <laughs> Just tell the, tell the story we're here for, you idiots. What are you up to? Uh, and today I'm worrying that I'm going to tell stories that I've told again, because I can't remember if I told them in this uh, original recording of this video or whether it was in a previous video, but uh, there's a place of reclaimed land in the UK. I remember visiting it as a kid. They So they dug a tunnel between the UK and France. You've probably heard of that. And uh, all of that soil or sand or whatever that they get from underneath the ocean that they had left over, they dumped it off the coast of the UK and built like a nature reserve there. Oh, I went there as a kid with my nan and it was really nice. I was like, that's crazy that this just land wasn't here before. And then in Macau, they're like, yeah, 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 we did that. There's, it's just a little nature reserve just sticking off for it, like off the side of the UK. And this is like, yeah, yeah, no, 33% of Macau is reclaimed from the sea, which is, didn't Japan like build an airport on land reclaimed from the sea? It's crazy. Humans are, like, engineering is amazing. I, I was going to say humans are amazing, but then we're about to find out how some humans are absolutely horrible. So I didn't want to say that. Visitors to Macau in the 1980s would not be treated to such an opulent spectacle. There were no skyscrapers, no mega casinos, and instead the forerunner to modern Macau was a city in which dirt piled up both literally and metaphorically. A Portuguese colony for 450 years, Macau in the 1980s was a city on life support, a holdout and relic of a once great colonial power whose relevance in and command of the world had long since diminished. It's kind of weird, like Portugal, little European country that I don't think anyone thinks about very much. Sorry, Portuguese people. I mean, it's nice. I've been. Your country's beautiful. But it's not, you know... I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 
just feels like I'm being a dick to Portugal for no reason. Yep. But it's small. It's kind of like Liechtenstein. Except, no, I mean, Liechtenstein's tiny compared to Portugal. But it's just like... I don't know, you don't really think about it very much. But it used to run like this giant empire. It's huge. Empire. Crazy. Although then I'm like, yo, British person, your country is the size of a shoe. And you had exactly the same thing, didn't you? Didn't you? A city so neglected, crime-ridden, and at times lawless, that some had taken to referring to it as the Wild West of Asia. Prostitution ran rampant. Triad people traffickers would lure women from Burma, the Chinese mainland, the Philippines, Mongolia, Russia, South Africa, and Thailand. Oh my god, you guys are all over the place. You pieces of sh**. With the promise of well-compensated and dignified jobs in the service sector, only to have their passports stolen by the traffickers, and then they were forced into sexual slavery. If they were lucky and stayed in the good graces of their captors, they would be released when they aged and were no longer profitable. If they were unlucky and their captors thought they might head to the police, then the Macau Maritime Police would be dealing with yet another tragic case of the mutilated and unidentifiable corpse of a foreign woman washing up on the shore. How about you do something about that in the first place? Like, they shouldn't be going to the police afterwards. You should be stopping the triads from doing this drug, the, the, the human people trafficking. I feel like human people trafficking is one of the worst things. Like, we talk about, I'm working on an episode. I say, I'm working. One of the writers is working on an episode on the Barley Nine now. Anyway, it's about this, like, Barley Nine, and they're these, like, I think seven of them ended up being executed for, like, smuggling heroin. And I'm like, what the f***? And there's people smuggling people? How are we even considering looking at drugs when it's, like, people are being smuggled? which is unimaginably worse. And I know, oh yeah, drugs destroy lives. Oh, what the f***? Stupid argument. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like human people smuggling is just the worst of the worst. The opium plague that had cursed 19th and early 20th century China had not ended in Macau. It simply evolved with the times, where once Portuguese merchants unloaded tons, uh, ton after ton of opium onto Macau's wharfs freely and openly, modern smugglers unloaded tons and tons of refined heroin from the port of Macau, openly bribing immoral dock workers and threatening the moral ones. Most certainly Macau of the 1980s was a city gripped by foul wickedness, and it is within those dark and dangerous streets in which today tale takes place yeah i guess also i'm giving the police a hard time but they are the triads it's like okay so i'm like put myself in the shoes of some macau policeman right and you're like okay ba -ba 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 -ba, i'm going about my macau police job and then someone comes up and is like yo policeman i'm gonna just uh, take this big crate and load it onto the shore here's ten thousand macau dollars or whatever they have yuan i'm not sure what's that chinese currency yuan Yuan? Something like that? I don't know, whatever. Like Macau dollars, let's say. Just look the other way. And you'd be like, uh, no, I'm a moral upstanding person. What are you doing? I'm going to call my buddies and you're going to get under arrest. And then it's like the next week, you're just walking along, bub, 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 doing Macau policeman thing. And they're like, yo, Macau policeman, we didn't, we tried bribing you, it didn't work. So listen, let this go, or we're going to murder your family. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> okay, I'll let it go. So it's like, you should have taken the bribe. <laughs> And I know you shouldn't take the bribe because people are people smuggling. You've got to put themselves in. You've got to. It's like in that position. What What are you supposed to do? And they will kill your family. They're the triads. They're like the, the Asian version of those uh, Mexican gangs in like Juarez. I saw that film Sicario. That I still think about how fucked up that movie is. It's not nice. Don't watch it. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> the Debt. The Eight Immortals was a Macanese restaurant. Uh, buried, sounds like a weird version of McDonald's. Buried deep in the industrial maze of the port of Macau. The restaurant was owned and run by Zhen Ling. Zhen Lin, as in Bin. Oh, Zhen Lin. Zheng Lin. George always provides these uh, nice, helpful pronunciation guidelines for me. Uh, Lin was the epitome of working class done good. An uneducated man, Lin had labored his entire life to provide for his family, firstly for his parents and siblings in his adolescence, and then later for his wife and children during his adulthood. He began working as a laborer at the port of Macau while only a teen after immigrating from the mainland, and after noticing the unquenchable demand for food and refreshments from the constant flow of people in and out of the port, he decided to improve his lot in life by pursuing a career catering to their famishing needs. Working within the confines of his meager means, Lin began working as a street vendor, selling food and drink from a street side stand, and eventually he was able to save enough money to invest in an actual restaurant, which he named The Eight Immortals. This is one thing, maybe less in China, I feel, but in, like, those Asian countries, like, 
Southeast Asia or whatever, all the, you know, like Thailand, Vietnam, all these places, like those, uh, I did that big backpacking thing. I think I mentioned this before that like gap year people do. And oh my God, that food that you buy on the street, just from the random street people. And I've been to Thailand a few times because my aunt worked in Thailand for years. And uh, there was like, they, they sell like fried chicken and oh my God, there's so much good stuff. And it's like so cheap. You'd be like, yeah, I'll have that. It's like 50p and you'd be like, oh my God like half a chicken fried on the street and you're like is it safe probably not but is it delicious oh yes oh my god my mouth's actually watering for some fried chicken from the street continuing the slow and like not clean streets it's like asian streets where it's like there's those little three-wheel tuk-tuks going past everything stinks of pollution everything's super hot all the time it's like where's this chicken being it's like not in the fridge is it you don't have you don't have electricity but you eat it anyway and then you take a horrible poo later too much information let's move on continuing this slow and methodical approach to business lynn continued to pool his ever-expanding profits and a couple of years later he invested in a hotel to complement his restaurant which in the spirit of continued tradition he named the eight immortals hotel zhen ling was living the dream of every mainland immigrant to macau work hard open a business provide for your family and make sure that your children get the best education opportunities that you can afford before sending them out into the world to enjoy bigger and better successes than you yourself could obtain but lin's otherwise impeccable and enviable life was blemished by a particular vice that would prove to be his and his family's undoing gambling Put simply, Zhen Lin and his wife, pronunciation guide please, Zhen Huawei Yi, uh, were gambling addicts. The urge to risk everything on a high stakes thrill was as adrenaline inducing and gratifying to them as a smoker breaking the seal on a fresh pack of Marlboro Reds. <laughs> There's a note, George Russell includes notes, he says, not a sponsor but I really wish they were. <laughs> George, I don't think we can have cigarette, we can't have cigarette sponsors. I'm fairly sure advertising cigarettes is illegal, even though where I live, and I don't really, th- I, I suppose I should think about this more, but it's uh, like generally any controversial advertisers, like about financial products or cannabis stuff, anything like that, I'm like, look, I don't want to look into the laws of whether that's allowed or not, so let's just not do it. Even though, I mean, there's no cigarette advertising on TV in Prague, in the Czech Republic, where I live, but to my amazement, still you could be walking down the street and a tobacco shop will have an advert for cigarettes in the window you go into the shop and the cigarettes are hidden like they're in a counter like with a roll down thing and you have to specifically ask for what you want but yet advertising outside the store is totally totally legal which i don't understand uh so what i'm trying to say is that i i don't think we can advertise cigarettes even though poster advertising here outside tobacco shops is still is still legal and the tobacco shop will be right by the bus stop so there'll be like kids waiting for a bus and there'll be a big advert trying like the the new one i see is these cigarettes where you press a little button and it makes it mint flavored and i'm like how is this allowed how is this legal uh after a stressful day in the office the grip this addiction had on the couple grew in tandem with the success of their business which in turn provided more and more resources for them to wager Accordingly, they were frequent patrons of Macau's many mahjong parlors, and it was in one such sordid establishment that they would cross paths with Hoang Jiheng, the man who would eventually. Oh, there's a note. Oh, a pronunciation guide. Hoang Jiheng nailed it. The man who would eventually end their and their entire family's lives. The Zhens and Huang Zhizheng were long acquainted before the killings. They drank and gambled together for many years, and eventually regarded each other very cordially. One evening in 1984, Zhen Lin, Zhen Huiyi, and Hua Ji Heng. <laughs> I'm really trying. I'm really trying. There is no try. And one of Lin's chefs sat down for a game of five card stud at the Eight Immortals with Chen Li Dong. Exactly how I pronounce it in English. Epic. <laughs> Uh, Zhen Hui Hui Yi's mother hovering around the peripheries as a non-participating observer. They all put in 16,000 pataka. $2,000? In the 1980s? That's got to be what? Like at least five, six grand a day. Oh my god, these guys are either rich or massively addicted to gambling. That since I play poker with my friends. This is another one where I'm wondering whether I've told this story in a previous episode of this show or whether I told it the first recording of this. I'm going to tell it anyway. When me and my friends play poker, 
like super rarely we're always like yeah we must get together and play poker and then like because we don't live in a movie where everyone gets together and plays poker at each other's houses uh we don't and but we try to but we pay for like ten dollars we all put in ten dollars there's maybe five of us and then someone leaves with fifty dollars after several hours and that seems like people still get involved with it at that price (laughs) two thousand dollars oh my god lynn sure of an almost immediate win on his second hand pushed all sixteen thousand pataka of his trips across the table his confidence being complemented by a large ear-to-ear smile that filled his face they showed their hands at which point those chips continued sliding across the table into the hands of huan ji heng uh oh not a problem lin boldly declared as he laughed off the loss with a deep chuckle i've come back from much worse losses than that before and i shall do so again uh oh lin you're in big trouble so you've sat down you've spent your entire two grand that you agreed to spend and you're like let's spend more money uh oh lin you're in bit this is not going to go well for you but he did not come back from those losses he lost his next hand then his next hand and then his next hand in a blighted pattern of luck that set the tone for the entire night as the night drew to a close lynn's smile had long gone he was down 1.4 million pataka that's a hundred and eighty thousand american dollars in 1984 oh my god that's got to be at least that's like half a million it's got to be at least half a million dollars in macau which didn't we establish was not the super rich place that it is today and even if it was the super rich place that it is today that's basically double more than double what the gdp per capita was so kind of roughly what people make in a year in modern day macau and i get that lynn's this rich business owning dude but my dude you are you are in the hole obviously he didn't have the means to settle this debt immediately so he and huan ji heng closed the night by negotiating terms of payments what about collateral huan ji heng soon asked you're standing in it if i don't get the money within the year i'll give you this damn restaurant finding these terms more than agreeable huang ji heng took his leave and disappeared into the night so he's basically valuing his restaurant at the value of his debt so he basically put everything he has into this hand and lost so now everything he built up is gone just don't gamble how about if you've never gambled or you do gamble or just keep it small don't get addicted to gambling please don't look it can ruin your life i mean good lord the clock was ticking for the Zhens, and huang ji heng had no intention of letting them forget it once a month for the next year huang ji heng would pop into the eight immortals and inquire about the status of his payments each time he was hurried out of the door without seeing a single pataka mate what do you think is going to happen when the year's up he's going to come and take your restaurant away from you maybe you should make or as we know spoiler alert worse how about you make an effort given what we know is coming later in today's story it may shock you dear viewer to hear that these meetings were always conducted in the spirit of mutual cordiality huang ji heng had no reason to be angry these things happen in gambling all the time he thought and whatever happened he was either 1.4 million pataka richer or the new proprietor of a most upstanding macanese eatery the murders The 4th of August 1985 was a typical night for the Zhen family. The Eight Immortals was full of customers, many regulars to whom the owning family were familiar friends, and a few new customers sampling its delights for the first time. Steam filled the air of the restaurant, carrying the mouth-watering aroma of Zhen Hui Yi's cooking with it. Zhen Bao Chiyong, the couple's eldest daughter, raced between the tightly packed tables, her arms laden with bamboo serving containers piled taller than her head jokes and laughter imbued the air the sound only interrupted by the regular clacking and slamming of the trusty old till as chen li dong zhen hui yi's mother collected the fruits of their collective labor an aura of serenity and joy filling the restaurant what what did i say i just remembered i i, I went to china a few years ago with a friend of mine just for a laugh and uh i'm just reminded of a restaurant we sat in we we're just i don't know where we were it's some random place and we sat down and all of the menus are in chinese but google translates amazing so you just point your phone at the menu and it translates it. so we're pointing what we want to have and it's like you know there's the chinese dumplings and they have the big tower you know the stack of the the bamboo baskets that they steam the chinese dumplings in. and they're taking all these out it totally reminds me of this um and one of the funniest things about that there was a there was a no smoking sign above the table we're sitting at but everyone in the restaurant is just smoking 
<laughs> so there's a great photo of my, I don't smoke, but uh, there's a great photo of my friend who, who's smoking. He's just sitting under this sign in a restaurant, having a meal, having a cigarette with a no smoking sign above him. I guess they just have the rules there and it's like, but no one cared. The restaurant was just filled with smoke. It was bizarre. <laughs> a familiar figure entered the restaurant and Zhen Bao Chiong goes to greet him and take him to a table. The man politely refuses, instead asking if he could see her father as he needed to talk business. Zhen Lin emerged from behind a beaded curtain and approached the man, who he immediately recognized as Huan Zhi Yang. He strolled across the rat. All these names are confusing, but this is the guy who owes the money meeting the guy that he owes money to. He strolled, <laughs> unless I've got the name super confused, but uh, I've got them written down, so if I can help you, listener or viewer, I will. He strolled across the restaurant, placed his elbows on the table, his head into his hands, and let out a weary sigh. This had become a regular and task and ritual for Lin, having to deal with Huan Ji Heng and his nagging every single month. Mate. <laughs> You're having to deal with his nagging. His nagging. You owe him the modern day equivalent of half a million dollars. If someone, if I owed my bank, my bank don't nag me about the money I owe them. They just take the money I owe them in a payment every month. It's called a mortgage. This guy, if my bank was just like, oh, hey, Simon, you owe us half a million dollars. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I know. Stop bothering me, all right? I know, look, I'll pay it back when I feel like it. My bank would not take kindly to that. And my bank is not a person who's about to, as we'll see, kill my family. I mean, I hope not. I feel like the bank would get worse reviews if they kill people's families when they don't pay their mortgages. Instead, they just take your house and put you on the street. <laughs> Which is kind of, I mean, not equally terrifying, but also not fun. This time was different, however. Today, Huan Ji Heng would not simply be hurried out of the door and close the day with pockets as empty and as light as when it began. He turned to Zhen Lin as he left and snarled at him, I'll be back later tonight. True to his word, Huan Ji Heng reappeared in the doorway as the restaurant was being closed up. He announced that he had quite enough of the delay tactics. <laughs> what delay tactics? He just shows up every month and the guy tells him to f off. This is like great delay tactics. Except now, now it's it's not going to be good. He gestured towards the large calendar that hung above the till and reminded Zhen Lin that as it had been over a year since the debt was incurred, he now owed the deed. He was now owed the deed to the restaurant as per their agreement. Zhen Lin finally snapped out of the bored disposition that had dictated his dealings with Huan Ji Heng for the last year and aggressively turned on him. He wasn't going to pay. And Huang Zhiheng must have been an absolute idiot to think that he was ever going to attempt to clear such a ludicrously large and unenforceable debt. Huang Zhiheng was no triad, he wasn't physically imposing, he had no political or social capital he could bring down on his head. Huang Zhiheng was a nobody, and Lin was absolutely sick of having to maintain the facade of legitimacy he kept while dealing with him for the past year. Yeah, man, but you owe him so much money that he can use some of that money to, like, enforce that debt he could go to like a triad and be like yo this guy owes me like half a million dollars i'll give you 10 percent of that if you uh make him pay and that triad's gonna go to him <laughs> and uh well he's gonna get that money isn't he because he's a triad and he's scary so what the <laughs> and we've got what i assume <laughs> and we now got what i assume is a is a uh uh what's it called embellished quote what the f are you gonna do about it then? You got no contract, you got no paperwork, you've got nothing! He barked this at, at Huan Shi Heng as he gradually closed the distance to him, bending his larger and broader frame down and pressing his forehead against Huan Shi Heng's forehead. The expletive ridden vitriolic tirade continued as Lin verbally tore down the pathetic little man who would take everything he had worked for over a drunken game, uh, drunken card game while staring him dead in the eyes. Go on then, show me what you're going to do about it. Lin continued on. At this point, Huan Jiang snapped and decided to oblige his request. He maneuvered his hands up to Lin's waist and shoved him away from him, using the newly created distance between him and Lin to plant a right hook on his jaw. Despite getting the jump on Lin, this went about as well for Huan Jiang as you might expect from Lin's description of him. Lin leapt forward and punched Huang Jiang in the stomach, winding him and making him bend forward, at which point Lin followed up with a punch to the face, which sent his opponent crashing to the floor with all the grace and dignity of a podgy amateur boxer going five rounds with Mike Tyson. Zhen Lin continued to beat Huan Zhiheng as he lay on the floor, delivering one powerful kick to his stomach. He grabbed him by the shirt and began to manhandle him towards the door, confident that the tiresome nagging about the insufferable debt was finally over. 
Unfortunately for Lin, Huan Jiang still had some fight left in him, and he struggled to and he struggled from side to side as he was escorted to the door. He reached just far enough to grab an empty bottle of Qingdao beer on the table to his side. Immediately, he flipped it upside down in his hands and brought it down on the edge of the table that it had just stood on. Yes, and I'm thinking about my trip to China with my mates. We drank a lot of Qingdao beer. In fact, every time I've been to China twice, I remember the first time. I think one of my nice memories of being a younger person, I remember I was backpacking around and I was in this hotel, just sitting out on a balcony on a beautiful day, having one of those Qingdao beers. Life was simpler back in the day. <laughs> I mean, I like, I, I, I'm generally like, as I've got older, I like my life more. Like, i am always been a pretty happy person, but I've always been, you know, all that stuff. But that was chill. Now it's like, oh my God, I got so much going on. I'm so busy all the time. The idea of just sitting on a balcony and having a beer. <laughs> This super alien concept, especially in the middle of winter. Anyway, enough reminiscing with fact, boy, let's get back to it. He swung the razor sharp improvised weapon over his shoulder, desperate to land any slash on Lin that wouldn't that would see him unhanded from his grip. Zhen Lin immediately did exactly that, releasing his grip on Huan Zhihang and jumping as far back in a simple single leap as would carry him. Huan Jiang slowly moved forward, his face plastered in the wicked confidence of a man who knew he held the power. The only exits from the restaurant were the customer entrance to his rear and the fire escape to his left flank. With every possible route of escape from the building carrying them within slashing distance of his broken bottle, the Zhen family all backed into the furthest corner, away from Huan Jiang, and screamed to the children to get behind them as they formed a quarter circle in front of them. Unfortunately, one of the children did not heed their parents' desperate cries and just stood frozen, staring at Huan Jiheng in abject fear, paralyzed like a rabbit caught in the headlights of a fast-approaching car. Zhen Quan Yi, Zhen Lin, and Zhen Hui Yi's seven-year-old son were scooped up by Huan Jiheng and raised off the ground. Okay, so the, again, just to clarify, because there's so many names, the two parents, one of their kids there, he's seven-year-old, seven years old, the bad guy who he owes the money to with the bottle knife bottle weapon sort of thing uh grabs the kid uh, he scoops him up raises him off the ground his legs are flailing in the air as he was pla as he's placed into a chokehold between hua Hang's left forearm and bicep he pressed the broken bottle into the boy's neck just hard enough to draw a single narrow line of blood and began to cackle now why don't you show me what you're going to do lin as the adrenaline controlling Huan Shihang's actions faded, he began to think clearer, and he plotted his next course of action. He never intended this to happen, but he was going to get his money. He barked at Chen Li Dong to fetch some rope, motivating her to hurry along obediently by squeezing his captive's neck just hard enough that he emitted occasional pain screams, and then he ordered her to tie up and gag the family. When her aged hands proved okay, so this is the mother, sorry. When her aged hands proved too frail and lacking the fine motor skills needed to complete the task, he passed it on to Zhen Hui Yi, who obediently set about the task given to her when the rest of the family was bound. He handed her Zhen Quan Li and ordered her to continue. Shen Quan, Shen Quan Li was the son. Oh my God, there's so many people. Yes, yeah, so that's the kid that he has. Hands her back to the mother who's tying people up and says, tie, tie everyone up. Okay, okay, we're there. The names, <laughs> the names. The moment Zhen Huayi's son was handed to her, her maternal instincts took full control. She bolted straight for the door, gripping her son tightly. She screamed for help in a deafening pitch, at which point Huan Zhiheng raised the broken bottle and without hesitation drove it into her neck as she passed. Holy shit. That's intense. Zhen Hui Yi fell to the floor and her son landed on top of her. She squirmed on the floor, desperately trying to find a breath, but with more oxygen escaping through her wounds than she could draw, she soon passed away. A thick pool of blood continued to form on the floor around her as her family looked on. Desperately, they tried to scream, but through their gags, they could barely muster a whisper and could do naught but look on in horror. Huan Shihang didn't utter another word to the family. His face was blank and expressionless. He took no pleasure from the task at hand, but he knew what he believed he had to do if he had any chance of walking away from this encounter as a free man. Oh my god. It's like that thing where it's like you've seen his face. You've seen him do his crimes. If those crimes are like murder and stuff, it's, you know, at that point you'd be like, well, might as well fight back because I'm probably going to be killed. He started with Zhen Lin. He dragged him from the corner and knelt down, knelt him down by the corpse of his wife. He looked him in the eye and silently drove the bottle into his neck before pushing him on top of her and then letting him share her fate. Huan Zhiheng folded his arms and watched patiently as he waited for his second victim to stop squirming. 
Then he moved to Zhen Bai Lam, Zhen Lin's 61-year-old cousin, and he repeated the process again. He kicked her to the side of Lin and Yi and watched her bleed to death, still not uttering a single word, the closest thing to emotion displayed being an occasional blink. The final adult in the room then met her fate. In a now sickeningly familiar pattern, Chen Li Dong, Zhen Hui Yi's 70-year-old mother, was dragged out from the corner and stabbed in the neck as Huan Ji Heng silently and patiently watched her bleed to death. Then it was the turn of the children. They, however, met a different end. Huan Ji Heng believed it too barbaric to stab them to death, so he opted instead to strangle them. Yes, what a hero! Except you're still killing the f***ing children. One by one, he took the children, lifted them off the ground, and looked them in the eyes. He clamped his hands around their neck and squeezed as tight as he could and waited for the tears, the wriggling, and the muffled screams to stop, before he tossed them aside and moved on to the next one. He saved. This was this was where I... Uh, this was more brutally described in the first one, like from the police reports and stuff, and I couldn't do it. And so I just skipped ahead and said he killed the whole family, and uh, I see George's decided to do the same thing this time because it was you don't want to look that up don't listen if you see this somewhere else and they go into the details just don't it's it's not nice i don't like i mean it was just i don't know i just think about it for way way too much and uh yeah, anyway, sorry, let's just move on. He saved Jen Quan Lee until last. The boy was still unbound and had sat petrified in the corner throughout the killings. Before he met his grisly fate, he uttered one single sentence to Huan Ji Heng. My aunt will call the police and have you arrested. As the poor boy fell limp and lifeless, he had no idea that his words had just doomed his aunt to the same fate as everyone else in the restaurant. Huan Ji Heng now knew that there was still another loose end to tie up. Chen Li Zhen, Zhen Hui Yi's auntie, was sitting at home late in the evening when someone buzzed her apartment intercom. Curious about who would be visiting her at such an unsociable hour, she picked up the handset and was met by a deep and unfamiliar voice. The voice didn't give a name, but whoever it was, they were panicked and short of breath. They explained that they were a family friend of Zhen Lin and implored her to race to the Eight Immortals with him because Zhen Quan Li was having a seizure and the family needed help. Of course, she immediately offered to drop everything and help him, and so after throwing on a jacket, she ran downstairs to greet the man. As I'm sure you've realized, to viewers and listeners, Huan Ji Heng was waiting for her. The pair hailed the nearest taxi, and by the close of the hour, Huan Ji Heng had tied off his loose end. Again, I think that was another point where we had police report description, and I was just like, no, 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 he just killed her, that's all we need to know, I don't want any details. And if you're wondering about the details, stop. It's not worth it. Chen Li Zhen's death brought the killing tree to a close. Huan Ji Heng had stolen ten innocent lives in a single night. Such a barrage of brutality can be a difficult thing to quantify and rationalize, so we'll take a moment to list the victims. Zhen Lin, owner of the Eight Immortals restaurant and family patriarch, 50 years old, murdered trying to protect his family's livelihood. Zhen Hui Yi, family matriarch, 42 murdered and died a hero trying to make sure at least one of her children survived. Zhen Quan Li, only son of Lin and Yi, seven years old, murdered while bravely refusing to cower before a demon of a man. Zhen Bao Chong, 18 years old, Zhen Bao Chong, 12 years old, Zhen Bao Wen, 10 years old, and Zhen Bao Hua, 9 years old. Four sisters murdered simply because they were loose ends. Chen Li Zhen, auntie of Zhen Hui Yi, 60 years old, murdered while selflessly trying to help a family. Zhen Bai Lam, cousin of Zhen Lin, 61 years old, murdered because her selfless devotion to her family put her in the wrong place at the wrong time. Chen Li Dong, mother of Zhen Hui Yi, 71 years old, murdered because she selflessly chose to spend her golden years aiding her daughter's business, which put her in the wrong place at the wrong time. Disposal with his evil work now finished, Huan Ji Heng set about the grim business of disposal, but how exactly does one set about disposing of 10 human corpses? You've only got to scroll through the Casual Criminalist archive, got a note here, which you absolutely should do anyway, and give Simon that precious algorithm love. Goddamn right. Uh, that, was, that was such a weird aside in the middle of all this horror. Good lord. To uh, find a plethora of testimonials which show just how difficult a task it is to dispose of even one human corpse without being caught, let alone ten. After some consideration and a night of restless sleep, as a consequence, I, George, frankly decided that this question was one that I didn't want to answer and I deleted the initial detailed chapter. The full details of the disposal can be found in articles and books that discuss the case should you really want to know. Oh, good. 
Ah, oh, we're just skipping it. <laughs> I know there's a- I, I'm sure. Because true crime is a little bit like this. I'm sure there's a small percentage of you out there who are like, okay, tell us how he disposed of the bodies. And uh, a small percentage of you are now going to be disappointed. And I'm totally okay disappointing you because I'm not interested in how he grounds up the bodies or any of this stuff of children. Guys, of children. Because I don't want people listening to this show who are into that. This show is not murder porn. It's about uh, murder porn, gore porn, whatever it's called. This show's about investigation and how people either get away with it or don't get away with it, whether they're caught, whether they're not caught. It's about the crime. It's not about the gory details of said crime. And I, I don't know if I'm doing a true crime show right if I'm not including that, but look, I don't want to and it's my show. Okay, and I won't let you on my yacht. And I hope you guys like it anyway, and hopefully you like it even more because I'm not doing that. That's what I truly hope. <laughs> I really truly hope. Ah, <laughs> uh, otherwise I've got into the wrong genre, haven't I? <laughs> Uh, but I worry that today's episode will wander too much into the territory of gore porn if we dwell on the matter too long and in too much detail. My idea for this episode is to promote the memory of the Jen family, and hopefully you all agree that this redaction is for the best. George, I don't care. I agree. And we're moving on. The important information for our story was that Huan Heng butchered the family's remains and exposed some into the garbage and some into the sea. And with that fleeting explanation finished, let us move on. Swiftly. Discover an investigation. Four days after the killings, on the 8th of August 1985, a local man was swimming. Oh, good lord, he's gonna discover something, isn't he? <laughs> Spoiler alert, Simon knows the answer because he's read this before. Uh, by Aria Prater, a beach running along the coast where Huan Zhiheng had dumped some of the remains. The man was happily swimming along, daydreaming about nothing in particular, and focusing on his breathing when he was interrupted by the sensation of something soft, squishy, and putrid smelling bumping into his face. Oh, I forgot it bumped into his face. Dude. He leveled himself out and lifted the wet goggles from his eyes to get a clearer look. His heart nearly leapt from his torso when he discovered it was a semi-decomposed human foot. That is rough. Police arrived quickly en masse. Uniformed officers occupied the beach to comb for more remains, catalogue what was recovered, and interview the swimmer. Maritime patrols sped up and down the coastline in speedboats, searching for any further remains. Between the combined efforts of the maritime police and the natural tide bringing them to shore, by the end of the day, eight pieces of human remains in total have been recovered. Four souls from right feet, two souls from left feet, and, four, and two arms. Attached to the aforementioned were two dorsal top sections of foot, four fingers, two toes. Wait, one to the top of the feet? Why is it just the bottoms of the feet? That is so... Oh, that is like... I don't know why that feels... I guess it's because the bottom of the feet, like, why I'm so sensitive to that idea. is like, I don't know, I'm mega ticklish. Um, fun fact about me. And just the idea of, like, the, just the bottom of the foot, like the most ticklish part of the body, just being there. This sends shivers down my spine. The police who catalogued the scene did some morbid mathematics and deduced that they had the remains of no less than four people. Two days later, on the 10th of August, a doctor walking his dog down, further down the coast was hauled towards the current by his canine companion. He had become entranced by some meat that it had smelt by the waterline. The doctor retched in disgust when he saw a human arm between his best friend's teeth and wrestled the limb away before too much of it could be consumed, and he notified the police, who, tailed, uh, who tallied it in their ever-increasing grisly collection after noting that it belonged to a female. Three days after that, on the 13th of August, two final pieces were discovered, a female right arm and a right heel. In total, 11 pieces of human remains were recovered from the waters around Macau. Officers on the beach initially assumed the jumbled remains belonged to illegal immigrants from mainland China, and it was hypothesized that a large group of people were crossing the water, either with ill-suited or improvised watercraft, and hit perilous waters, which caused their vessels to disintegrate and the group to drown, the shocking conditions of the remains being attributed to the work of sharks who had feasted on the group after their demise. Oh my god, this is so grim that this is what the police assume happens. So that means that that happens. Like, it probably happened before. And, like, the migrants in boats things. There's a crazy politician in the UK. I can't remember his name. He was in, he was, like, for one of our, he was, like, the leader of a right-wing party. And he was, he's just a complete dickhead. And 
when he was asked and for some reason he got like into political debates and stuff people would actually he'd, he'd be in a political debate for god knows why he never i don't think he ever his party ever had a seat in the house of parliament or anything like that in house of commons and he was being interviewed oh god i'm glad i can't remember his name because if i screwed this up it'd probably sue me but he was being they were you know it was not an interview but like a debate and there was a question asked to the politicians like what should we do about the uh migrant boats coming across the water into into i can't remember if it's europe or the uk and he was like well we should shoot them or like sink them like shoot the boats to sink them or something and it's like oh my god <laughs> you actually are a f-ing monster christ and it's like look i'm not pro illegal immigration <laughs> but i am totally okay with a refugees and also b not f- murdering people and processing through them through a granted super f-ed up system but uh at least a super f-ed up system is better than them being drowned politician whose name i can't remember you bell end macau police cid ran with the hypothesis and began examining the remains after they were carefully delivered back to type a police station in refrigerated and thankfully smell type boxes as the remains were entering the early stages of putrefaction and decomposition after several days floating at sea the hypothesis quickly collapsed however as the forensic scientists who examined them noticed exceptionally straight and clean cuts on the remains uh if their can if their condition or lack thereof had been from a shark attack the edges of the limbs would be torn and shredded they formed a new hypothesis that these limbs had been separated by human hands with a large heavy and razor sharp implement such as a commercial grade meat cleaver a dedicated task force was immediately est- established by the macau police to investigate further unfortunately the police found no substantial substantiated leads in the months that followed and the case gradually began to go cold as officers were pulled from the task force to deal with more pressing and solvable cases pressing there is someone who has murdered many people and put them in the ocean i feel like that's a really pressing case you've got a mega serial killer on the loose that was until is it are you a serial killer if you kill people like on mass like that or are you just a massacre this massacre mass killer I feel like there's a difference although i'm not sure serial killer is a strict definition there's a number but then there's also other conditions aren't there anyway whatever let's just call him a monster that was until april 1986 when a mr lin a surname that should sound familiar to you dear viewer sent a letter to the interpol office in guangzhou and the macau police department i feel super dim but i don't remember who lin is <laughs> there were too many names and george is like dear viewer and i'm like i'm hosting the bloody show and i can't remember who lin is <laughs> oh i assume george is about to tell us or i hope he is because i'm too dim to remember i also took a 15 minute break after the children were killed because um i needed to and i wanted coffee <laughs> the letter outlines the cons- the letter oh it's it's the surname of the guy it's like a relation of him the letter outlined the man's concern for his brother Zhen Lin, whom the author of the letter claimed he had not heard from in eight months. He explained that his brother was an honest, hard-working family man, unlikely to be involved in any shady dealings. Or, oh yeah, time's passed. Eight months, a long time has passed because the case went sort of cold. Uh, sorry, I should really pay more attention, shouldn't I? Christ unlikely to be involved in any shady dealings or have any need to hide or abscond he went on to explain that he had contacted friends in macau previously to go and check on his brother for him these friends reported back that lynn and in fact his entire family were nowhere to be found at the eight immortals restaurant the eight immortals hotel or in fact any of the frequented locations that he asked his friends to investigate furthermore he went on to explain that neither of the aforementioned premises were abandoned quite the contrary they were all bustling and as busy as ever but with a new proprietor claiming ownership of them mr huan ji heng what this i mean that is very bold i mean if you've murdered 10 people you have to run away you have to run away to like chinese alaska or wherever like because that's where i mean it's just very bold isn't it he then gave details about the last time he had seen his brother back in july of 1985 when he traveled to guangzhou with his two youngest daughters zhen bao wen and zhen bao hua to visit himself and some of their mutual relatives uh he closed his letter by offering his own hypothesis he speculated that zhen hui yi his brother's wife had been having an affair with huan ji heng who may have jointly plotted to kill his brother oh uh, well i mean you're you're elaborating a bit you're not far off he did kill the brother but the wife didn't have anything to do with it i mean and she was murdered as well with the kids 
He explained the disappearance of the entire family by guessing that after Huan Zhiheng had replaced Zhen Lin as family patriarch, some kind of argument ensued, and Huan Zhiheng, realizing the leverage the murder conspiracy gave Hui Yi over him, killed the entire family to protect himself. He begged the police to investigate and signed his letter off with his chop. I don't know what a chop is. Is that that like block thing that you sometimes see, uh, like Chinese letters signed with? Is that China? Am I just butchering all of Asian culture together? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't mean it. Uh, but there's like a red stamp, right? I've seen this. Is that? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm probably just like Simon. You have absolutely no idea about any culture other than your own, do you? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I don't. Okay. So this guy's just. He's made it more elaborate than it really is. I mean, the simple one, where it's like he murdered the whole family and stole his restaurant over a gambling debt, just seems so absurd that you'd have to assume there's more to it, wouldn't you? But there's not. The police found the claims in the letter substantial enough to warrant an investigation, good, and they called into the Eight Immortals restaurant, where sure enough, Huang Heng is found proudly proclaiming himself to be the proprietor of the establishment. They interview the man whose brash confidence and room-filling personality wanes and falters as soon as conversations about his ownership and possession of the restaurant are raised. Yet, yeah, you can't just walk in and take over someone's life and business. It's like there's gonna be there's gonna be a business. It's gonna be registered in their name. Like I don't know. I have a business. If someone killed me and just started like doing it for me, some other bald bearded dude, it would be like well at some point there's gonna be, you're gonna need a signature on something or an ID or a check for something, aren't you? And at that point you're gonna be like oh yeah, well the business isn't actually registered in my name. It's registered in the dead guy's name. Uh oh, <laughs> something's gonna come up. How did you expect this to just work? With the claims in the letter so far having been vindicated, they investigated further. They dug through tax records and government documents to look for traces of a sale. They found no such documentation. Instead, they discovered that the restaurant's deed of ownership and liquor license were still in Zhen Lin's name. Of course they were. If he goes to change it and Zhen Lin's not there, they're going to be like, uh, no. Come here with the guy who actually owns the business and we can figure this out. <laughs> you can't just... What are you doing? <laughs> How long do you think this would work out for? I mean, although I do think it's been a long time since I've had to do anything with my business where they actually needed to know it's me because everything is so, like, online these days. But... Still, at some point, it's going to come crashing down. <laughs> they then continued to escalate their investigation and trawled through the police's warehouse full of unsolved death and murder records. They reviewed corpse after corpse, case after case, comparing every scrap of information available to the notes of the Zhen family, which remained pinned on the most prominent wall of the investigation room for reference. Soon they came across the case file of those limbs that washed up on a beach back in August. They compared a few scattered fragments of fingerprints that they were able to recover from the remains, and they found a match. The fingerprints on one of them was a match for that found on Zhen Hui Yi's government ID file. Well, that's a... I mean, I feel like... It's, it Was Macau... Macau was part of China uh, at that point, so... Oh my god, I'm gonna sneeze. Am I? Am I? I don't know. No, I think we're good. I think we're good. I mean, China... So it's part of China, I'm definitely gonna sneeze. <laughs> ah! Yeah, I guess that's one good thing about China. Like, they, they take your fingerprints and stuff. Although now lots of countries take your fingerprints. Last time I went to the US, they took my fingerprints. And I'm like, this seems a bit invasive, but okay. <laughs> They'll be like, well, give us your fingerprints or you can't come in. And you're like, yeah, I know. It's not like I'm committing on crimes or anything. I just feel like... No, I kind of... I'm okay with them taking fingerprints. Like, I'm kind of okay with my DNA being in one of those big databases. And I'm kind of okay with them using it to find golden state killers and stuff. People are always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a slippery slope. And I'm like, what, a slippery slope to, like, catching more horrible murderers? I don't know. I guess I've just thought about it. I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> Let's all get fingerprinted. People will be like, Simon doesn't like privacy. It's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. The police were now confident beyond reasonable doubt about exactly what happened to the Zhen family. The hunt was now on for the smoking gun piece of evidence that would let them nail the bastard. The police then set about interviewing the owners and employees of the business around of the businesses around the Eight Immortals restaurant and found 20 useful witnesses who vouched that there had been some kind of incident in the restaurant. Most reported hearing shouting, with few giving more detailed testimony about hearing crashing furniture and some kind of physical alteration. You may be wondering now to viewers why none of these 20 reported this to the police that night. Remember that violence was commonplace in 1980s Macau, and believing they heard no more than heated arguments or minor fisticuffs being exchanged, they didn't believe it worthy of the police's attention in light of the more major incidents that occurred uh, on a typical day. Yeah, I don't know. I live in a big city. If I hear some scuffle outside, I'm not calling the police. <laughs> is, that, is that bad? I'm like, I don't know. It's probably just two dudes having a fight. It's like, what do you want to do? Like, they're having a fight. Or like, they're drunk. 
or i don't know it's probably nothing and the police don't want to be involved and yeah that's that i don't know maybe i don't know whatever <laughs> The police also eventually managed to track down former employees and various professional contacts of the Zhen family. A chicken and duck farmer who used to supply the restaurant reported to the police on the 4th of August 1985 that he made a delivery to the restaurant in the early hours of the morning and all was completely normal. Zhen Lin and Zhen Hua Yi were both alive and well, and he saw the children hurrying out the door to go to school, all in the picture of perfect health. The next morning, however, he delegated the delivery to one of his employees, who reported finding a note on the door of the restaurant claiming that they'd be closed for three days. Zhen Lin and the man were on very cordial terms after years of doing business, so he paid him a courtesy call that evening after finishing work. He found it out of character for the hardworking and dedicated man he knew to be taking a break and leaving no one to man the restaurant. He found it even stranger when the door was opened by a stranger, Huang Heng. A neighbor of Chen Li Zhen was probed about the missing woman's whereabouts by the police, and she gave testimony that on the 4th of August she saw a man who appeared to be in his 30s knock on the door of Li Zhen's apartment. She happened to be carrying rubbish to the bins at the time. She believed she'd become privy to some juicy gossip, so she hung around a nearby corner and, and eavesdropped to find out exactly why such a young man knocked on her 60-year-old neighbor's door. She testified that she heard the stranger explain that a relative of Li Zhen's was running a fever and needed her help. Being disappointed by such a mundane explanation, she moved on and thought no more of it until the police came knocking at her door. But actually, now that you mention it, I haven't seen her since then. Which is weird, isn't it? She added, Yeah, it's a bit weird. Your neighbor goes missing for eight months. I guess if my neighbor, like, again, you think it's absurd not to do anything. But I know my neighbor. I'm cordial with my neighbor. I don't know her well. Um, I don't know any of my neighbors particularly well. And if one of them just wasn't there for eight months, I'd been like, I'd be like, well, they moved out and they didn't say goodbye, which was weird, but they moved out or they took a break or they, I don't know. I wouldn't call the police. I wouldn't really do anything about it. I'd just be like, oh, haven't seen them in a while. <laughs> Best part of a year. But I wouldn't do anything about it. Am I just completely non-vigilant or are you guys in the same boat about that? That seems totally reasonable, <laughs> which is weird. You may have noticed a particular irregularity in their testimony. Huan Heng was not in his 30s, and consequently, the police suspected for a time that it may have been a younger accomplice. We already know, of course, that this was not the case. Okay, so she was just mistaken. Slowly but surely, the police built up a healthy body of evidence that they could use to prosecute Huan Heng and the murders of the Zhen family. But still, it wasn't enough. They needed to find that proverbial smoking gun if they wanted to guarantee conviction. They continued their investigation. They found that Huan Ji Heng had dismissed all of Zhen's staff and hired his own team since taking over the restaurant. Odd, given how acclaimed and well-received the restaurant's food had been during the Zhen's ownership. Yes, definitely odd for the police, but also not odd at all when you know the real story, because you're like, they're going to be asking, hey, where's the old boss and his entire family? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> and why are you signing my paychecks in the name of the old boss? <laughs> okay, I'm going to call the police. This is weird. Uh, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense for him to fire them all. They also discovered that Huan Ji Heng had taken up residence in the Zhen family home with his wife, daughter, and son. Dude, are you, like, trying to get caught? He also had leased out all of their rental properties under his own name. Once again, he did not provide any paperwork or evidence to show how that he had come, in, that he had come into the properties legally. The Arrest and Interrogation on the afternoon of September the 28th, 1986, a 19-year-old border guard named Quan Kin Hong was sitting at his kiosk in the Pro Posto Fronterico das Portas do Cerco. My Portuguese pronunciation is almost as terrible as my Chinese. Maybe even worse. Uh, maintained border crossing. The young man was bleary-eyed from a night of heavy drinking, and he barely paid any attention to the mundane and repetitive tasks his ever-so-thrilling occupation presented him, checking and stamping an endless stream of documentation with his head slumped in his left hands. <laughs> I recently played a game, I actually played it on stream, uh, called Papers, Please. Uh, it's available on my Brain Blaze channel, I think. And where you play the role of a border guard and it's intense it's i mean i'm assume being a border guard in real life is extremely boring but in this game you've got to watch out for like spies and terrorists and there's all sorts of stuff and if you don't do it right they'll send you to a gulag because it's like set in like fake ussr or whatever glory to us i think was the, the whole thing um 
Fascinating aside, fact boy. Thank you. Get back to the story. To his right, stapled to a wall, was a large black and white photograph of a rather menacing looking man in his 50s. Some guy called Huan Ji Heng, who was going to be detained if he tried to leave. The young Kin Hong had no idea what the guy had done, only that it must have been serious for his mugshot to have pride of place in his kiosk. This was quite a commonplace procedure, and one that Kim Hong was no stranger to, but sadly, on a normal day, nothing terribly exciting ever came of them. Little did the young man know, however, that today was, not going, was going to be anything but a normal day. A large car pulled up at his checkpoint with a family of four inside. They were going to visit family in Zhuhai. How thrilling the young officer thought as he took their passports from their hands and began to inspect them. The mothers was fine, daughters fine, sons fine, but something didn't feel right about the father's documentation. He lifted the passport from his desk and held it in front of him, and that was when it twigged. He put the passport down and kept his head facing forwards, peering at the aforementioned mugshot on his wall <laughs> in the corner of his eye. <laughs> and again, embellishment here. me he thought. It's Huan Ji Heng. In an instant, his revolver was out of its holster and pointed squarely at the driver of the car. He kicked the panic alarm beneath his desk, and officers swarmed the car and placed Huan Ji Heng under arrest. After his arrest, he was interrogated by the police. His stories and explanations changed repeatedly, and ultimately, his alibis proved as watertight as a sponge. He claimed he bought the Eight Immortals restaurant and the hotel legitimately from Zhen Lin in cash, hence why there was no paperwork. Yeah, but it's going to be signed over to your name. Just because you bought something in cash doesn't mean there's no paperwork. If you bought something like a building, you'd be like, yo, yo, yo. Even though I'm paying you in cash, I need something that says that building is now mine. Otherwise, it's just like I'm giving you a pile of cash. This is, did you not have time to think about this over the last better part of a year? Come on. Terrible criminal. I mean, obviously a terrible human being, but also shit crimes. According to Huan Zhihen, Lin wanted to relocate to the mainland and offered him a good price for expediency. Later, he conceded that he had won them as payoff for a gambling debt that Lin owed him, but maintained that the exchange was mutual and cordial, the Zhen family simply having disappeared to start afresh on the mainland. That's a better excuse. I don't think it's going to hold a lot of water because we know that the bodies have been found, but uh, it's a, that's a better place to start. I'm surprised that's where you went second. When being probed about his initial claim of having bought the businesses legitimately, the police naturally asked how he came into so much money. First he claimed to be a professional gambler, then he later admitted to being a smuggler. This was a lie, of course. Huan Zhiheng was never a smuggler. This was just an ill-thought-out belief that admitting to a less major crime would somehow get him off the hook for the murders, despite the overwhelming evidence that pointed the finger squarely at him being the murderer. Yeah, no, it's a pretty good strategy if you don't know what the police hold in their hands, right? Because at that point, the police could be like, if they didn't know and they didn't have the bodies and they weren't super suspicious of him, they'd be like, well, okay, he's, he's just a smuggler. They'll probably, they might, if they're not very good, turn their attention elsewhere because the guy's admitted to the crime that he thinks he's come in from. But the police hold all of the cards here. They know what's up. So I don't fault his strategy there, the criminal strategy. Huan Ji Heng's arrest also had the benefit of finally giving the Macau police the justification they needed to search his residence. <laughs> Really? You don't... Uh, the stealing the guy's business. The renting out his properties that are not owned in his name. The living in his house. It's not even his residence. <laughs> it's not even his house. Upon executing the search, they found the key to Zhen Lin's safety deposit box, the entire family's passports, as well as the birth certificates and student IDs of all five children. One of the rules, like we have the, the, the rules of the casual criminalist that people compile, is like, yo... <laughs> If your crime is worse than the punishment for destroying evidence, maybe you should destroy that evidence. <laughs> not legal advice. I'm not giving advice to criminals, but I mean, why are you holding on to the IDs, dude? What are you up to? It's not smart. You're going to get in trouble. When Huan Zhiheng was asked about why these items were found in his possession and not taken with the Zhens abroad, he refused to answer. He pretended to have an asthma attack in a sad attempt to end the interview. When this didn't work, he became emotional and threw what can only be described as a tantrum. Sweeping the copies of evidence laid out before him off the table and onto the floor, he slammed his hands down on the table and screamed, eventually threatened to commit suicide by biting off his own tongue if he wasn't released immediately. As you surely know, police officers have a duty of care to the people in their detention, so the officers did the only thing they could have done in that situation. They threw him on the ground, restrained him, and gagged him. For his own protection, of course. Oh no! <laughs> It's like, oh no, if his, if his face hit the desk brutally on the way down, he'd be like, oh no, <laughs> what happened? It's like, and then his nose is broken. Yeah, yeah, he, he fell. <laughs> ah. 
Oh my god, it's like... <laughs> I'm always like, yeah, police brutality is bad. But when you know, reading one of these, that the guy is guilty and he murdered children, I'm like, oh no, he was killed in police custody. Oh no! Uh, during this altercation, he also fell and hit his head on the desk. He literally did. I genuinely didn't remember that from my first read through. Twice, if you can believe such rotten luck. I'm sure Simon and you dear viewers at home are just, did, just as gutted as myself that, Xi, uh, that Huan Zhiheng proved to be so clumsy. Eventually, however, due to the absolute cavalcade of evidence that showed his guilt, Huan Zhiheng was finally arrested, irregardless of the totally consistent and believable lies that pulled out of his backside, and he was formally charged with the ten murders on the 2nd of October, 1986 suicide. Following Huan Ji Hang's arrest on the 2nd of October 1986, he was transferred to Cologne, Cologne Prison, the only adult prison in the small territory of Macau. Wait, so there's one adult prison and one child prison? <laughs> Dark. It may come as a shock to viewers to learn that child killers tend not to receive the fondest reception in prison. Yeah, it's like things I'm upset about the prison system. How child murderers are treated is not high up there. It's along with how pedophiles are treated. It's like, oh no, prison's rough for them. What a terrible thing. And that the unsavory characters that make up the rank and file of a prison population are generally much less restrained in expressing the dissatisfaction the police officers that gave Huan Zhiheng a good shooing in the interview room. It took less than 24 hours for him to receive a savage beating in prison. <laughs> Dude, if you're in prison for, like, child murdering, just, what's that show? There was a show about a kid who ends up in prison, and, God, this was years ago. Absolutely years ago. I can't remember the name of the show or anything about it, other than one line that really stuck with me, was, uh, the guy's, like, in there for whatever. I think he was in there because they thought he raped someone, so he was, like, a sexual predator or whatever, and uh, he was innocent, but one of the prisoners pretending to be his friend is like, look, if anyone asks whatever if you're in here for something like that just say that you robbed a rural post office in wales no one cares about that but apparently this was like and someone later asks him and he says like i robbed a rural post post office in wales and apparently that was like prison code so uh they knew he was a predator because everyone apparently is told that that when they come in and it's like oh no and uh yeah and so they knew so why are we on this tangent i have no idea but that was a weird show anyone remember that show Definitely remember that part of it. In the early hours of the 3rd of October, a group of inmates began forming around the single occupancy cell that held Huan Ji Hang. Mysteriously, the normally exceptionally fastidious and attentive wardens forgot to lock the cell door that night. Oh no. I know I know I'm kind of cheering on extrajudicial punishment here, but uh I remember the because in the first version of this script, I was privy to the details of the murder for my sins. And uh, look, in this case, I'm kind of okay with this extrajudicial beating. I'm okay with someone getting the shit beaten out of them, to be honest. If they're like, I'm okay with that. If they deserve it. I, I don't know. Is that bad? I, it's interesting on casual criminal social, I find myself questioning my morals, which I guess is a good thing. But I often find myself coming down on the side of like, nah, I'm pretty good with that. <laughs> Which maybe just makes me a bad person, I'm not sure. Uh, the heavy cast door of the cell was ferociously swing open by, swung open by the group, impacting the thick brick frame and letting out a deafening crack that echoed around the otherwise silent prison. The group of inmates piled into Huan Ji Heng's cell and set about giving him a quick and brutal introduction to prison justice. How exactly not one single warden heard the door slam or the agonized pleas for mercy coming from the cell is a mystery. A mystery I don't suppose we'll ever solve, or try to solve, or care about. <laughs> In yet another mysterious turn of events, a guard happened to patrol past Huan Ji Heng's cell. At the very moment all of his assailants abandoned their noble hunt and fled the scene, the battered, bloodied, and bruised man was scooped up off the floor and into the back of an ambulance, and he was transferred to a local hospital and kept under armed supervision while he made a recovery. The unlikely twists and turns keep coming in this episode today, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe it took him only a day to recover from this savage beating? That's what the prison warden testimonials I examined for the completion of this episode said anyway, and I, for one, can see absolutely no reason to doubt the word of these high-working, hard-working, 
and dedicated men and women. Huan Zhiheng attempted suicide twice after his arrest. The first unsuccessful attempt came on October 4, 1986, only two days after being charged and one day after that mysterious, random, and absolutely not orchestrated beating. He found a steel rubbish bin with a few millimeters of sharp edging along its rim and pushed his wrist into it with all the strength that his fully healed body could muster. <laughs> fully healed in uh, quotations and made a large cross-shaped cut another inmate found him almost immediately and he was rushed back to the hospital and he was just he was discharged from earlier the same day where after five hours of surgery he was sadly saved or uh, there's a note here from george or maybe not sadly if he's alive he gets more beatings Whee! <laughs> The second successful suicide attempt came on the 4th of December, his injuries up to this point being so profound and life-threatening that he was actually allowed some time in hospital to recover. He had been returned to prison a couple of days before, where he found his cell gutted of absolutely anything that could be used to cause harm. On December the 3rd, while eating lunch in the refectory, he managed to subtly pull the ring tab from a can of Coca-Cola and slip it up his sleeve and then down into his pocket. That night, when the landing lights disappeared, making the marking the end of the warden's patrols for the day, he sat alone in his cell and he used the ring pull he ferreted away previously to reopen the still healing wound on his wrist. He was found dead at 8 a.m. when the wardens brought him to his breakfast, his corpse long cold by then, and with him died any chance of justice ever being served for his tenants and victims. Ah, uh, sort of. Sort of. I'm always like, you know, of course you want to see it go through the court system in an ideal world and him being sentenced to death or whatever. Um, but in this sense, it's like, well, it's the same outcome, isn't it? And we know he did it. He's 100% did it. It's ironclad evidence. And then he killed himself because he knows he did it. Um, so there's that, I guess. Bright side. God. Bright side in the darkest shit. Wrap up. I suspect, much like myself, you're feeling somewhat emotionally numb after hearing this twisted tale. Yeah. Not as numb as I felt reading the first version, though, George. <laughs> Sadly, there's no great moral payoff, no great retribution that will ever fall upon Huan Zhiheng to punish him for all his sins. Put simply, he killed ten people over nothing but a gambling debt, occupied their lives as a dark doppelganger, and then, just at the point it appeared he may actually face some consequences, he got to end his life on his own terms. This is the world we live in, sadly. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. Such is life. At least, we can derive some slight schadenfreude from the brutality endured during his short time in prison. At least he got to enjoy a slight taste of the pain that he delivered to the Zhen family. Oh, that does not compare. It is the slightest. Getting savagely beaten in prison is not like killing someone's entire family. I suppose that I would be savagely beaten in prison every day, forever, instead of someone killing my family. I suppose this is at least better than him getting completely away with murder. Let us at least try to lessen this depressing aftertaste of the story by making sure we remember the man correctly. Cast your mind back to the pathetic situation we discussed when Huan Zhiheng was arrested. Cast your mind back and recover the image of a petulant child masquerading in the guise of a middle-aged killer. This is the image of him I'd like you to take away from this episode and burn into your memories. Don't allow him any kind of infamous mystique. No one was allowing that. Oh, I know why this is there. There was a. Uh, this was mentioned in the old script. I guess this is just like a vestigial thing. There was a movie based around this, and it wasn't into. I mean, it wasn't sympathetic to him or something like that. But it was like, you know, it was a serial killer movie, fictionalized, and I guess that made it mystique for some weird people, maybe. But no, 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 no. This was just a horrible fucking dude. No, I want you to imagine a middle-aged man throwing a tantrum, slamming his arms down on the table as he's forced to take responsibility for the first time in his life. Remember him as pathetic, because that's exactly what he was. Dismembered Appendices Number one. You may be wondering how we're able to construct such a detailed recounting of these macabre events. Luckily, those interested in this case actually have a wealth of primary sources available to them if they read Chinese. We got these sources because while some of the inmates locked away with Huan Zhen took it upon themselves to deliver savage beatings to him, good lads, others took it upon themselves to foe befriend him and encourage him to be forthcoming with the details of his crime to people that he believed were like-minded. Dude, this so. There's so few people who are like-minded like you. You are a broken person. This is specifically with the intention of being able to allow the surviving Zhen family some clarity and closure. 
Number two, Huan Zhiheng maintained his innocence until the end. Before his suicide attempts, he sent a letter to the editor of Macau Daily News in which he protested his charge and proclaimed his innocence. In these letters, he said outright that he had every intention of killing himself in the immediate future, so he had no reason to lie. He denied killing the Zhen family, but could not provide any kind of alibi. He then asked the public to be forgiving to his family, who were ignorant of the whole affair that he apparently had nothing to do with, and closed the letter by stating that his impending suicide was due to his failing health, and they wished to end his life on his own terms and was not to be taken as any indicator of guilt ah i take it differently number three more of the Zhen family's remains were eventually recovered beyond the time frame that we focused on in today's episode on february the 20th 1989 bin men at municipal clo bin men at a municipal dump close to the eight immortals restaurant discovered a large amount of skeletal human remains police descended on the scene and concluded that they did belong to the Zhen family but they were unable to verify which family member most of them belonged to individually Number 4. On the matter of cannibalism, if you ever encountered this case before, or the movie inspired by it that we discussed at the beginning, which we didn't, but we did in the previous version, you'll no doubt have heard testimonies and claims that Huan Zhi Heng fed the Zhen family to the patients of the eight immortal to the patrons of the eight immortals not a single shred of objective evidence has emerged to support this claim meaning any discussion of the matter is purely speculative is it possible sure proponents of this theory will explain how no foul smell ever overtook the murder scene so the bodies must have been processed quickly in some way to stop them decaying to rebut this i'd simply draw attention to the fact that all the bodies were disposed of on the night of the killing this episode was horribly dark and it was more horribly dark in the first version so i'm kind of glad that my microphone didn't work because i found today's one i mean i feel like i could say more palatable but it just feels wrong um it was horrible and yeah but uh, i hope we dealt with it tastefully because i know it's easy not to deal with these things tastefully if you like the episode no no don't do that whistle boy just end it there just end it there